Welcome to the Holy Land in this biblical site of the Kidron Valley, also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It lies right between the Old City, which is in front of me to uh, the left, and the Mount of Olives, which is behind me and to the right. So the valley runs right up through here. I can see the Garden of Gethsemane behind me, but the valley uh, starts up a ways up there. And then it runs all the way down, and we'll show you more video, but it also runs clear down to uh, just south of Jericho, and then goes to the Dead Sea. So the Kidron Valley is actually quite a, a large valley here, but the main part of it that is referred to in Scripture is in this area right here. In between the old city, the eastern gate, is right up there uh, to my, uh, in front of me, to uh, uh, your left up there. So this is right here where uh, Jesus was the Garden of Gethsemane. He would have passed through here, gone up to the Eastern Gate. House of Caiaphas is behind me, Southern Stair. So anyway, we're right here in the Kidron Valley. A lot of things happened here, and a lot of things will happen here. In fact, um, in this particular area in the history of, of Israel, uh, this is an area where they would throw a lot of their trash, actually kind of behind uh, you in front of me. And we'll show you, you can see in this video, even today they still throw trash. And then to the um, kind of the uh, uh, southeastern side of the, the city walls is the dung gate, which means kind of the gate of trash. So you know, that's where they would throw a lot of their trash out and they would burn it out because the, the winds would uh, take it and, and uh, take it away from the city instead of blowing it back into the city. So this particular area, uh, you know, as like you say, behind uh, you in front of me is where a lot of the trash was even uh, to this day. So anyway, uh, this here is the uh, Kidron Valley. And as we mentioned, a lot has happened here and a lot will happen here. So the main thing that comes to my mind when I think of the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat is judgment. That is the word that comes to my mind, the judgments of God and the final judgment that will happen right here in this valley uh, at the end of the Great Tribulation period. Uh, the people living in this valley, uh, you can see them right here, they have no idea what awaits them. But according to Scripture, right here is where Christ will gather all of the nations. He will appear on the Mount of Olives uh, just to your right, uh, to my left. He will touch down and He will gather all the nations together. He will allow Satan and the demons power to gather them all together. So the nations will be gathered here to fight against Christ at the end of the tribulation. He comes back in power and great glory. We will come back with Him. The angels will come back with Him. According to Revelation 1-7, no, no eye, no being that has ever been created will not see Him. So right here is where the uh, part of the battle of Armageddon will take place. And this is the Kidron Valley where uh, Christ will separate the sheep from the goat. So the best word that comes to my mind, I think, to describe this place is the judgment or the judgments of God. So in this video, we'd like to talk about the judgments of God. Uh, it's a, a, a topic that's not very popular, uh, but it's a topic that is all throughout Scripture and deserves some time and attention. So let's uh, talk about the judgments of God, and particularly at the end time where He separates the sheep from the goats, and it says that the uh, the wine press will be right here. God will uh, uh, press. He will. This will be the wine press of, uh, where He exercises His great wrath. And it says that the blood will flow through here up to the horse's bridles for a distance of approximately 180 miles to 200 miles. So that means that the blood will flow from this wine press right here for around 200 miles. So that means it will go east right down this valley. It will go down towards Jericho, south of Jericho, to the Dead Sea, take a right, go all through the Dead Sea, clear down to approximately the Red Sea. That's the distance of around 200 miles. So anyway, let's look at the judgments of God. It's gonna be a sobering video, but a video that is very important that Scripture talks about. And so if Scripture talks about it, and Christ preached a message of repentance, John the Baptist preached a message of repentance, and Christ talked more about hell and the judgments than he did about heaven, then I think that uh, we would be biblical to uh, give the judgments of God a fair shake. So in Joel 3, 2, it, it uh, mentions this place here. It says, uh, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. So if you think about it, throughout all of Israel's history, the nations have been against Israel. And at this particular time, the nations are more so against Israel.
Israel than ever before. We've been in the city here for a couple weeks and it's been full of tension, police everywhere. Some things have happened on the Temple Mount. A terrorist attack happened while we were here. A Palestinian ran into uh, some policemen, some other vehicles, killed some people. Tensions are high. Getting on the Temple Mount was very difficult. So right now there has been not been a time when the nations are more against Israel. And God says, I will judge them partly here because of what they have done to my people. So even though the, the uh, Jews have not followed God like they should, God is still going to uh, met out his judgment upon the nations who have abused them and uh, been and treated them evilly. So it says in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Kidron Valley are synonymous terms, exactly the same thing. So then in Revelation 14, 20, we see this wine press at the end, right here in this Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It says this in Revelation 14, 1920. Then I looked, this is John, uh, the, uh, the apostle writing from the island of Patmos, uh, talking about the end times. He says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. A sickle is what they use to cut down the wheat. It chops it down. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had a sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, and its grapes, for they are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, this is right outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia, which is approximately 200 miles, and it would go, as we said, down uh, to the Dead Sea, to the right, south, down to the Red Sea. So right here is where this great wine press of God is at the end of the tribulation where he gathers the nations and he, and he harvests the earth and the blood runs down right here in this valley. So in this video we talk, we'd like to talk to you about the judgments of God and the reality of hell and the fact that um, God is going to enter into judgment not only with the nations but with all people. In fact those who are alive at the end of the tribulation when Christ comes back and says, and we'll read it in a moment, he separates the sheep uh, from the goats and they're in the wine press. So, we must understand that while the Bible talks a lot about the love of God, and rightly so, God is love, and we don't want to, we want to exalt and rejoice in the love of God. It's absolutely amazing what Christ has done for us on the cross. We have seen it. We have been in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have gone to the places where we believe Christ was crucified, and it's absolutely pain-wrenching as we really look and contemplate what Christ went through, approximately 18 to 20 hours of intense suffering. Uh, also the spiritual weight he bore as he paid for our sins for eternity. It's absolutely amazing and God has exercised his love. He has spoken to us. He has given his word. He has sent the prophets. He has sent Christ. He has sent his spirit. Uh, he speaks to us all the time. He's been called the hound of heaven. He is always pursuing us because he loves us so deeply and he is not willing that any should perish and that all should come to the knowledge of the repentance, the knowledge of truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his own only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. So God's message is a message of love. However, for those who reject their Creator, reject what Christ has done, and in essence slaps that offer in the face, and rejects their Creator, who pursues them, turns their back on Him, and, and uh, down trods Christ's uh, work on the cross, then for that person, unfortunately, there awaits judgment for them. And the Bible talks clearly about that. So uh, let's, look, let's just look at some of the judgments that God has already exercised. Uh, we see that uh, God created the angels uh, good before creation. A third of them fell, followed Satan. They entered into judgment, and now they are reserved in chains of darkness for the lake of fire, Scripture says. Uh, God created Adam and Eve, gave them a commandment not to eat of the tree of, the good, of good and evil. They disobeyed, and what happened? 
Uh, God says in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Both, both physically and spiritually, mankind died. And in, now is a need of a redeemer. So there was judgment upon Adam and Eve for their disobedience. Uh, then we see uh, Noah and the great flood where God wipes out everyone except eight people because of their wickedness, for their hearts were just per continually pursuing evil. So we see God exercising judgment upon them. We say later on after the flood, we see Sodom and Gomorrah and their great wickedness, their sexual immorality. And so God exercises judgment on them and wipes out uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the nation of the Canaanite nation uh, of whom the Israelites drove out. They were intensely wicked. Uh, sexual immorality was rampant. And God gave them plenty of time to repent. In fact, about 400 years when he spoke to Abraham and gave him the, the covenant that he would give uh, Abraham and his offspring the seed and, and the land. Uh, this country, uh, God says that, that, that their sin is not fully ripe yet. So God was even waiting for the Canaanites to repent, of which they didn't. So God drove them out and many of them were killed. That's why, as you see in Scripture, when God had uh, some of the people, men, women, and children, all killed, it was because of judgment upon them. And God saw that it was better in His mercy to stop evil like a cancer than it would be to let it to j just go all over the country and the world and spread like wildfire. So that was an act of God. God's love, even though some people uh, misinterpret that. Then when the people come into the, the, the land of Israel, the promised land, uh, God has Moses separate them, or tells Moses, when, when you go in, he to, that Moses told the people, Moses didn't go into the promised land, but he told Joshua and the people, when you go in, uh, uh, one half of you will be on Mount Gerasim, uh, and one half of you will be on Mount Ebal. And half of you are to pronounce, those from Gerasim are to pronounce blessings for the nation of Israel if they would, if they would obey. And then those on Mount Ebal would yell back the, the, the curses of God. And it's interesting that the blessings are about 25% of, of Deuteronomy 27 and 28, but the curses take up about 75% of those two chapters. It's interesting that God spends three quarters, 75% of the time talking about the curses rather than the blessings. And so then, whenever God would judge the nation of Israel, whether it be uh, throughout the judges when they would fall, whether it be uh, the, the nation of Israel under under the kings, the prophets, uh, when God would send in the prophets, whenever he would judge, he would, he would be referring back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28 and the curses because he was just in judging them because he had warned them uh, and he has sent them prophets, but they did not take heed. So God was justifying himself in judging the nation of Israel. And of course, the, the northern tribes were led into captivity and by Assyria in 722 BC. Then the southern tribes were led into captivity by the Babylonians in about 586 BC. So God refers back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28. They're the two key chapters where God is justifying himself, that he is just in pronouncing judgment and, and, and punishing the nation of Israel for their disobedience. So, uh, and contrary to what uh, some people might think, as we mentioned, Christ actually talks more about hell and judgments in the Bible than he does about heaven. Some people would say, I love uh, Jesus, the, you know, the God of the new, the new Covenant, the New Testament, because he's a soft, a loving, more uh, accepting God, of which he is, but he is no less a just God. And so therefore, Christ, being very God, spoke the very words of God, so he spoke more about judgment than he actually did about the blessings. It's my observation as I analyze Scripture and I see that God spends more time on judgments than he does on blessings, that the heart of man responds better to uh, judgment warnings than he does to blessings. It's like, like my children when they were growing up. They would always res respond better to strict discipline than they would if I said, okay, I'll give you a candy bar if you'll do this. They always responded better to the discipline than they did to a reward. So anyway, just an observation that uh, seems to be in Scripture. So, so let's look at some of the Scriptures uh, that Christ talks about and the New Testament talks about and the Bible talks about the judgments of God. Once again, it's not a popular topic, but it is a very pertinent, very appropriate topic because it's not spoken about today, but the Bible is actually loaded with it. And we would be unbiblical, we would be unwise, and we would even be, I think, I'll use the term, even disobedient to leave out large portions of Scripture because we do not care for them or the people that we speak to don't really want to hear about them. So it does not change reality. The judgments of God are fixed uh, realities that are 
existent and we can either accept them and heed them or we can face the consequences. It's like gravity. Gravity exists whether I believe it or not, whether I want to hear about it or not. Uh, the reality of the judgments of God and hell exist whether or not it makes me feel good, whether or not my people want to hear it, whether or not it's a popular uh, topic in our, in our day. It is a reality and so we would be wise to look at it and take heed to what God has said. So I'm just going to read you some scriptures. This is not my own uh, interpretation. This is not my own invention. This is not what I'm trying to manufacture. These are just verses right from Scripture. Most of them come from Christ. So here we have Mark uh, 9 43. It says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire, unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. Second time he mentions it. Uh, third time, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where there will be where their where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So right here we have a reference of three times Christ talks about hell and describes it. Unquenchable fire, the worm never dies. So if Christ mentions it three times, and whenever we have something mentioned repetitively, we know that it is a truth that to God is giving us extra uh, warning about. In Matthew 13, 47, uh, Christ says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and, and, and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, unquenchable fire, the worm never dies, a fiery furnace, weeping, a gnashing of teeth, a gnawing on their tongues in pain. In Matthew, 4, uh, Matthew 25, 41 it says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, eternal fire prepared for the devil, de devil and his angels. Some would say that uh, hell is not eternal, but if we're going to say hell is not eternal, then we're forced, if we're going to be biblical, to, to, to say that heaven is not eternal because it's the same eternal, the same Greek word, the same Hebrew word, the same word is used for both, eternal. So, um, it is an eternal place uh, prepared for the, de for the uh, devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, 46, and it says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So once again, the same exact word used for eternal punishment as those who go into uh, eternal life. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, 1 9 says, it says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So hell in some sense is a separation and eternal separation from God in hell. So hell is where God is not. So when a person uh, goes to hell, they are by their own choice going to hell. It's not like God wants them to go there. They are choosing to not be with God. They have chosen in this life to reject Him or are choosing to reject Him. And so that rejection will carry over to uh, eternal death in hell separated from God. So it's a person's own choice where they are rejecting and choosing separation. So God in some regards is giving them what they want. They don't want anything to do with God. So God says, okay, if you don't want anything to do with me, then the other alternative is uh, away from me. And that is what hell in essence is as well, is a separation from God. In uh, Jude uh, 1, 6 and 7, it says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, this is talking about the falling, fallen angels, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. 
just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality. Some would say that Sodom and, and Gomorrah were, were uh, punished and wiped out because they weren't friendly to one another. Right here it says it was because of sexual immorality, dominantly homosexuality. Uh, men with men, women with win, women. And you can see in Genesis this whole account of uh, Lot and what happens uh, in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and why God punishes Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says, uh, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, um, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, Romans 1 talks about that, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So God is referring back to the Old Testament and the judgments there as an example of the judgments that await us. So if God uh, fulfilled all the other judgments and exercised judgment, then we can have all the full confidence and be warned that the judgments that are still prophesied and the reality of hell are true and will take place. Uh, we have a Revelation 20, 11 through 15. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky. Another uh, uh, translation for sky is, is the heavens. Uh, the earth and heavens fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. God is keeping track of every little thing we all do, and we will give an account for it. If we're a believers, we will give account before Christ at the, at the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, not for salvation, but for our works, our service, our devotion to Christ. But those who have not received Christ will stand before this great white throne to be judged, and it's being written down, and they're judged according to what they have done. So believers, do not appear at the great white throne. Believers are not judged regarding salvation. They are born again, they are saved, but they do give an account before Christ at the wedding feast or the uh, judgment seat of Christ, also called the Bema seat of Christ. But the unbeliever stands before the great white throne of whom it says, heaven and earth flee from his presence. So here's my question to my unbelieving friends. If on judgment day, the heavens and earth cannot stand the presence of God. What makes you think you will be able to stand His presence if the heavens and the universe cannot stand His presence? It's a very sobering reality, and Scripture says it's a fearful thing in Hebrews to fall into the hands of the living God, for He is a consuming fire. He is not one to uh, play with. Our souls are not to be played with. Life is not a game. And it says that, um, and I saw the dead and great, small, uh, great and small standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book, uh, which is the book of life. And the dead, dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades, uh, it's kind of the Old Testament for Sheol, for the grave, also uh, uh, refers to hell as well. Gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So a person uh, is born once, dies physically. That's the first death. But then they will then die a second death. That's an, that's an eternal uh, death. We're, in, we're, we're alive. Our souls are alive, but it refers to being dead and, and in hell under God's judgment. And that's once again eternal. So, as we've mentioned, in this very place, the Kidron Valley, Valley of Jehoshaphat, is where Christ, at the end of the Great Tribulation, will gather the nations. He will gather all individuals. Uh, the nations will be judged. Individuals will be judged. The sheep will be separated from the goats. And right in this valley right here, this Kidron Valley, the blood runs up to the horses' bridles uh, all the way out. So. It says here, and the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horses' bridles for about 1,600 sta uh, stadia, which is about 200 miles. So, right here, uh, these people in this area were, were filming this on uh, 
partially on the Mount of Olives just to the side where I'm standing on some spots by some graves. We're filming this. Um, this is a place, uh, as I say, when I think of the Kidron Valley, I'm thinking of the judgments of God and of the great judgment at the end and of the eternal judgment, uh, the reality and the existence of a literal hell of which Christ spoke about over and over and over again and the New Testament mentions over and over and over again. So, so right here we are. So. My dear friend, if you are a believer, uh, we should take heed to the warnings. We should be fervent in, in sharing the gospel with others. We should live a purified life. Uh, scripture says in Revelations, you see these things, it should, should cause us to purify our hearts. Uh, uh, scripture talks about purifying our, ourselves as we see these judgments. We should be living uh, preparatively for Christ's second coming. Uh, we should be uh, taking heed to the reality of hell and telling others about Christ. We should be talking about the judgments of God. We shouldn't uh, well, walk away from them and only talk about God's love. And it's been my uh, observation uh, in our period of time in history that we're, we're, we're preaching really only a half of a gospel. We're preaching about the love of God, but we're not telling people about repentance. We're not talking about God's judgments. We're not, we're not telling them what they need to be saved from. Uh, we're just kind of preaching that, that Christ wants to help you better your life and have this great, wonderful life. But he's, we're not talking about true discipleship. We're not talking about taking up our cross. We're not talking about the reality of persecution. We're not talking about the reality of the judgments of God. Uh, John the Baptist pe preached a message of repentance. Uh, Jesus preached a message of repentance. However, we're leaving out about the first half of the gospel that it talks about the wrath of God and the judgments of God and why we need a Savior. If we don't talk about all of the gospel, if we don't talk about the first part of the gospel that talks about our condition, we don't talk about God's wrath upon uh, the person who has not received Christ, then there's nothing to be saved from. So unfortunately, many people today are living lives that aren't uh, really true, genuine, uh, born-again lives because they're just looking for the blessings of God and what God can do for them. They haven't given up anything. They haven't given up their life for Christ. And so therefore, it's a half of a gospel that's being preached and they're not really saved from anything. And for those of you out there that might not believe in literal, literal hell, then I guess the question I would have is why does Christ suffer on the cross? Why does he go through all this pain? Why do we have the resurrection? Why do we have all this? Why do we have the work of Christ if there's nothing really to be saved from? So my dear friends, I believe scripture clearly teaches there's a literal hell. There are the judgments of God. History shows us God has uh, judged people as we looked at all of the Old Testament. And if that's the case, we can be assured that uh, the future judgments of what takes place here and the reality of hell is a an, an existent reality as well. So uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope that you have learned some things. I hope that we're more sober and more reflective and truer disciples as a result. And we're more engaged in sharing the gospel with others as a result of the judgments that do await this earth and each individual who rejects their creator and slaps in essence the face of Christ and all that he did on the cross for them. So thank you for watching. Uh, God bless. And I hope that this video uh, moves your heart to live for Christ in a stronger way. God bless.